Our first, our first speaker is uh, Jamie Goodfriend. Jamie is the, um, is the Chief Strategy Officer at the Intelligence Group. She is recognized internationally as a dynamic and motivating catalyst for helping business leaders go beyond pure data-driven analysis to provide a platform and methodology for understanding the why behind young consumers' preferences, attitudes, and actions. Through Jamie's understanding of consumer behavior, she helps guide chief marketing officers and CEOs to develop innovative products, breakthrough marketing, and digital strategies and forward-thinking HR practices. In, in addition to placing generational cultural developments into the relevant business context, she frequently serves as a bridge to Silicon Valley. An early pioneer in digital entertainment, Jamie worked for Microsoft, Expedia, and Prodigy. Uh, she also served as a business development executive uh, focused on international marketing for Saatchi & Saatchi in London, uh, Lufthansa, and Procter & Gamble. Would you please make welcome Jamie Goodfriend. Good morning. I love Sydney. This city has inspired me. And I wanted to incorporate a little bit of that inspiration to my talk today. So I went to the pylons, and as I was trudging my way up those stairs, it's not that easy, I noticed this amazing sign in the stairway. I think it's because I was trying to catch my breath and not look like I was doing so. And it really reminded me of something. This is the sign. This was how they, they, simp they identified how they went about building that amazing bridge. My fellow speakers and I are going to present you with some amazing information today. And what I realize is that even though we're going to give you some incredible information, you are all experts. You're the experts of your brands. You are the experts for your products and your stores. And what we can do today is give you a vision of the future, but put it into some simple terms so that you can take the information we're providing and make it a simple tool. Now, understanding consumers is my part of this today, and I can try to help you understand it by putting it into a little bit of context. Because the way, what we really believe is that if you understand your audience better than the next guy, it gives you a strategic advantage. Now, I also had a chance to go to Bondi Beach, and I don't know how many people had got to go see Sculpture by the Sea. Just amazing, right? This was a, a sculpture that I saw there, and I thought it was a really good metaphor. It's a stairway, an infinity staircase. And it's one of those things that really helps remind us about the differences between the younger generations. Younger generations, they need to know where they're going. They need to know as consumers, what is the product I'm buying? How is it made? What's the purpose? And why do I need to have a relationship with you, the store? or the brand. They don't want to be sold. They want to be collaborated with. And understanding this difference is going to help give you that perspective, those simple tools that will help you have an advantage over your competition. So one of the amazing things about technology that's also slightly confusing is the fact that it should make it so that consumers are easy to reach, right? And it is. They always have their phones in their hands. How many people sleep with their phones? I just want to get a quick poll. Raise your hand. Right? Well, 80% of the people around the world, 18 to 34, sleep with their phones, which means that every moment of the day, technically, is a shopping moment. And yet, it's never been harder to engage them. It has never, ever been harder to make them care about your brand, your product, or your message. Why is that? What's the simple tool that I can help you make understand that? Well, here's the answer. There are 2 billion people under the, between the ages of 18 to 34 around the world. And for them, they care far more about their brand me, their personal brand, than they do about anything that you want to sell them. The only brands, stores, or companies that they care about are the ones that are in service to their personal brand. Remember, in the era of social media, everybody knows what everyone's doing all the time. So they need content. And they need content 
and communications that gives them social currency, so that makes them stand apart from the crowd. So that's the idea of what they're looking for. So let's see how that manifests. One of the biggest differences for this young generation that is kind of perplexing to business owners is this idea that it's not just about ROI. And now there are probably some of you in this room right now that just said, what are you talking about? ROI is why we live. Well, it is. But to have a more efficient ROI, you have to have something that we call ROR, return on relationship. That's part of that collaboration. That's part of that idea that young consumers don't want to be sold. So I'm going to give you some examples. Many of us have had this terrible experience of flying, right, where you're cramped in, it's terrible, they charge you for your bags, they charge you for every last thing that you're going to do on the plane. Well, Singapore Airlines is a company that decided to take a chance, and they've now decided to make coach more spacious, to give people free food and free entertainment. And if you look at the way that people think about that brand, people actually really love an airline. That's hard to accomplish. So they focused on ROI, which will most likely improve their, their ROR, and it will most, most likely improve their ROI. Another example, Lululemon. Interesting brand, really great brand, but in the last couple months, they've had some problems. They made product where the yoga pants were a little too see-through. Now, if you're doing yoga with see-through pants and you're in that position, that's not good. In fact, it's very not good. And unfortunately for them, some of the senior management took the stance of, well, it's the consumer's fault. They bought the wrong size, it was the manufacturer's fault, or maybe their bodies weren't really great for those kind of yoga pants. They've had some problems lately. So they've had a little dip in their stock price, they've had a dip in their consumer satisfaction. So they focused on ROI and not on ROR. Now, they're a smart company, I'm sure they'll rebound, but that's the difference. So what I want to do really quickly, and there's a lot of you, so we're going to take one minute, and I want to show the power of what it means to have relationships. What I want you to do is, when I say go, show me on your hands from one to 10, how much you are a guru in terms of people asking you for recommendations. So 10 means people come to you and say, what restaurant should I go to? Tell me something I should buy. What's a great product? That kind of thing. Ten, that's 10. Zero means you live in a cave and no one asks your opinion about anything. OK, so show me on your hands. 10 being you're a guru. Zero means you're a hermit. Ready, go. Let me see. How much do people recommend? I've got some nines. Way in the back, I've got some, Oh, I've got a 10 back there. That's good. What do I have over here? OK, great. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to turn to the person next to you, pair and share, you're going to find one person, maybe you'll meet somebody new, and I want, for one minute, I want you guys to share something that you're passionate about. Share something that you would recommend uh, to buy. Ready? Go. Ten more seconds. Okay. Now what I want to do, thank you. I know this is great, right? Do we have any brave souls in this big room that want to volunteer something that they just learned? Just raise your hand or shout it out. Come on, somebody. Be the first one. Where's Jack? I know Jack will share. I'm here. Okay, Jack, tell me something you learned. Are you sure? He should drive an Audi. He should drive an Audi. <laughs> Anybody else want to share something? Somebody in the back? Okay, you're shy. You need more coffee. 
Well, the point of that exercise is to remind you, as brands and stores and institutions, that the power of recommendation depends on relationship. And you are much more likely to buy something if you know the person or you feel like you have a relationship. That's return on relationship again. 84% of all purchasing decisions are influenced by the opinions of family and friends. So that means that part of what we need to have you start to become is part of the conversation. That's a big shift. It used to be so easy, you could just put an ad out there and that was it. But now consumers want a relationship. So when we talk about mastering return on relationship, here are the three things to think about. Here are your simple tools for a complex task. We're going to talk about knowing your audience, speaking their language, and understanding their world. So let's talk about who this audience is. So Gen Ys and millennials didn't just come from nowhere. They were raised by baby boomers. Now, baby boomers were a giant generation after the war, World War II. And they were told around the world that there were going to be so many kids that the competition with their children, the competition for their children, uh, for jobs, to get into college, for attention, was going to be massive. So they wanted their Gen Y children to feel special. So they essentially conducted a large-scale social experiment, and they stuffed as much self-esteem as they could into their children. So now you have two billion people around the world who feel special, <laughs> and who believe that their thoughts and their opinions are incredibly valuable. Now what's interesting is they're all directly connected to every one of you, and they want a response within 30 minutes or less. So that's a pretty challenging paradigm. But that's the dynamic of what we have going on here. And that's how Gen Ys have that unique characteristic. Now here's a little secret. We're just jealous of you Gen Ys, so I promise not, I'm not making fun of you. Only a little bit. So I'm a Gen Xer. Who here is between the ages of 35 and 48, 9, right? Gen Xers. OK. So it went boomers, giant generation, and then it was a smaller group of Gen Xers. And here's the thing. We were raised by wolves. We did not have playdates. We did not have helmets or sunblock or seatbelts. We are not friends with our parents. When we got out of school, if we didn't have a job, we would rather live on the street than move home with mom and dad. Am I right? Right? So Gen X is really important because many, many of you are Gen Xers. And Gen X are the parents of Gen Z. Those are your future consumers. So I will get back to that. All right, Gen Y. Who are my millennials in the room? Don't throw tomatoes at me. You have changed everything. There are so many of you, and you've changed everything. You've changed how we shop. You've changed how we communicate. You've changed how we entertain ourselves. And for the rest of us in this room, we do not understand you. You are incredibly group-oriented, and you are incredibly idealistic, which is amazing. We really need to learn how to manage and work with you, because you represent the future. So you have new behaviors. Part of what has happened with Gen Y is through social media, we have this era of new transparency. Again. Everybody knows what everyone else is doing. So if you're a manufacturer, people are going to find out what your policies are. If you're a politician or an artist, they're going to find out whatever it is you're doing. Gen Y cares about this, and this is part of their social currency. Social media is not just about communication. It's about transparency. Gen Y believes that anything is possible. And just to prove that point, this guy, who would have thought that Psy would have taken over the world, right? Gen Y doesn't just want to make money, they want to make meaning. So they truly do believe that anything's possible. So just so you also know this, the new Psy is What Does the Fox Say by Yulvis in Norway. This is the thing that's taking over the world. It's kind of crazy. Millions and millions of downloads. So here's another thing to think about, Gen Y. They are never offline, right? You see them with their heads down constantly. They are never, ever offline. So there really is no more going online, which again means, and here's to remember this, 
Every moment is a shopping moment and they're always connected. It's really important. So you have to always be connected. Gen Ys have shifted how we operate. We don't live in a nine to five world anymore. We actually live in a 28 seven world because they're never offline. In fact, Gen Y, we call them, I want what I want, when and where I want it. Immediacy, they want things when they want them, how they want them. Customer service, product selection. Mobile is a huge area that I urge you to pay close attention to. It means that for many Gen Ys, we start our, that you guys start your shopping experience mobily. Now what's fascinating is, because Gen Y is always connected, the world is pretty seamless. They don't say, I'm on my mobile, now I'm going on my desktop, now I'm going on my tablet. It's all one fluid experience. So when they are used to having an orderly, uh, on-demand experience on their phones, mobily, when they go into a store and there's no connection, so that the mobile experience does not feel similar to the in-store experience, it's very jarring. So it's time to think about it not as multiple different channels, but one fluid experience that takes you across every opportunity, every channel. That's the big difference. That's what sophisticated marketers are starting to get to. When you have this kind of connection and you think about the mobile world and the digital world as integrated into the rest of your business, you can do amazing things. So J. Crew this year, they went on to Pinterest. They've been on Pinterest for a while. Now Pinterest is really interesting. 15% of all internet users use Pinterest. That's a big number. And a quarter of them buy what they pin. So J. Crew this year, they put their catalog of new fall items on Pinterest. And they made it exclusively available on Pinterest so that you could order things early. Huge sales for them. Stock price was up. Free people, same thing. And free people took it one step further. They rewarded their pinners with having exclusive items that you could not get into the store. You could get them early on Pinterest. Created a lot of social buzz. Really smart. The experience generation. 70% of these young consumers prefer a cool experience over a cool product. Now think about that feeling when you discover something that's special. Maybe it's something that your uh, parent share person told you. But your job as retailers, as store owners, is to help them have a unique experience, to help them feel special, to help them discover something that's unique, that's just for them. That's really important because if every moment is a buying moment, they don't want average. I can have extraordinary at a click of a button. So help them find things that are extraordinary. As part of this unique experience, they have big expectations. So there's everything from the, this mall in Shanghai called K11. What they're doing is they're operating in the culture, not in the category of a mall. And they are bringing unique experiences to the shopping environment. They've got an art gallery. They are helping consumers understand what the urban experience can be like. They have an actual farm on site. It's really fantastic. In fact, we're working with Westfield for their new World Trade Center premier property. It's going to be amazing to help really operate in the culture and not just be a mall, but be an incredible experience, which will help drive people to come to the stores. De Kiriko, I guess, is a, I have not been there yet. It's in Melbourne. It's an amazing bakery because the experience is just so unique that really can differentiate your store from the competition. So let's talk about speaking their language. It used to be people wanted big logoed items to kind of signify that they were in. They were into the status movement, that they knew what was hot. And you saw like Abercrombie or Gap or some of these other brands. But now it's not about identifying yourself as being part of a brand tribe. It's about having the opportunity to talk about me, brand me, and my own personal imprint. We actually call this movement debranded. It's a macro trend that's going to be around for a while. Consumers aren't as interested in big logos. They're more interested in the story of your product. They're very interested in quality over quantity. 
and they want to be able to show some of their personality in the things they buy. So the idea is that the brand vision needs to be in the product, not on the product. This is a company called Honest Buy, and it's pretty interesting. What they do is they are completely transparent about what it costs to manufacture the product and what their markup is. So now that might be heresy, that might be an ROI killer for many of you, but it's the vision of the brand, and people love it. It's a very popular brand. This idea of luxury, new luxury, is not logos. Bernard Arnault from LVMH actually was very famously quoted recently, and he said, we're in a stage of logo lethargy. And he said, there is value in scarcity. So what did he do? He launched a new line of Louis Vuitton bags with no logo. Pretty fascinating. Nivea worked with Yves Behar, the noted industrial designer, and they redesigned their products. 15% less plastic, really well designed, very small logo. Those products are doing incredibly well. This also lends itself to uh, grocery stores and consumer packaged goods. It used to be called generic, these products that were made by the stores, but now they're called own brands. And consumers really believe that they are smart enough to make a decision so they don't even need a high-end brand because they know the story of the companies that are making these products. We're going to see a huge jump in these owned products. Really interesting. Now, part of this debranded is the increased desire for customization. Coke started a program here that then went around the world, and I know Westfield was really involved with it, where they took the label, the Coke label off, and replaced it with the names of people in that country, like 150 of the top names. And then you could also go and get your name put on the bottle. It was a huge success. It raised the sales in Australia alone by 4%. And this last summer, they took this campaign and they rolled it out to 20 countries around the world. Hugely successful. All about customization. What is in it for me? So let's talk about their world. There's been a huge shift in this connected, connected world that we're living in, and my colleagues will talk to you about this, again, where, where technology has connected you directly to everybody. There's been a shift in this relationship. We actually call uh, consumers a different thing now because they've gone from being passive consumers, think about that stairway, where you'll just blindly buy things because that's what's on the shelves, to being participatory. Now, Starbucks tapped into this because they have this idea platform. It's a really interesting uh, program that they have. They allow consumers to put their ideas up for what they think the company should do. It's free research for Starbucks, and people feel like they have a say, like they're communicating with the brand. But we're taking it one step further, and there's actually a concept now that we call them venture consumers. They want a stake in the outcome. They're not just going to passively buy your product anymore. They want to have a voice, and just like investors, they want to feel like they are being recognized by the brands that they support. Shopping is the new activism. And your consumers, especially the young consumers, they vote with their wallets. So we did a focus group, and I'm going to share with you a quick video from the consumers themselves so you can kind of see how this is manifesting. Can we play the video? With such little control that Generation Ys have these days, it's awesome to be able to like channel our creative energy and to really um, support projects that we really believe in um, and have that kind of creative control. You know, examples like Kickstarter where you can contribute to something that's, that's a little bit bigger than, than any idea that you might have had is, is really cool because you're, you're a part of something larger, something that you wouldn't have been able to do on your own. And, uh, and it's really rewarding to be able to be part of that experience. When we decide to spend money, um, we try to stretch every dollar and make it go farther. And that means that we don't just go out and take brands off the shelves or take um, products off the shelves. We really want to have a say in what that next good or service is going to look like, how it's going to function, when it's going to be in our hands. It's, it's a way of voting, really, of me putting $10 down on this Kickstarter campaign or this Indiegogo campaign. I am making something great happen, something that without my help wouldn't, would may, may not necessarily happen. Um, so having that kind of um, social influence behind your wallet is something that's very powerful and relatively new, I think. We 
want to feel like we're a part of something big, you know, a part of like the new thing. And also with the perks and all the interesting things, it's kind of like a fun way to engage with a community. You can be a part of something that maybe is has a very niche uh, attitude towards it or something that you personally want to see happen, but that, you know, corporate America isn't necessarily going to make happen. Like, for instance, my friends are redoing a Power Rangers movie. And to some people, they have no interest in that, but some people are like crazy about it, you know? And they're just like pouring money at this project just because like that idea of like reconnecting to something that they've already been involved with or like loved as a kid, that emotional aspect, and like also supporting young entrepreneurs is big. Instead of walking into a store and having all of these decisions um, pre-made for you in the form of a product on a shelf, we can become a part of that process and we can make the decisions um, with our dollars. And that's a pretty remarkable thing. I would invest in an established brand, one, to connect my name to that brand and be a part of its brand history and trajectory. Um, also because an investment usually brings profits and some kind of return. Also being able to be a part of its exclusive previews or getting the final product and knowing that I influenced it in some way. Um, and then finally, just to be able to connect my name and have some kind of acknowledgement within that brand. Being an established brand means that you've done things a certain way for a certain while and people have been okay with that. Whereas my generation, if you want our vote, if you want our dollars, then you have to uh, involve us in that process. So many of the boomers and the Xers in this room are going, I don't like that. I don't want to pay attention to it. So I'm not saying you have to like it, but this is a paradigm shift, and this is the new reality. This is the future. It's not about customer service. It's about that relationship. So they're not just consumers. They're investors, and they're investing in your brand. So a couple of examples. Kickstarter is this fantastic crowdsource uh, crowdfunding platform that they were referring to in the video, and it means that people can collectively support something they're passionate about. That means they're very engaged. Now, Kate Spade, great retailer, they launched a new brand called Saturdays. When they do an ad campaign, they launch it first on social media. They go behind the scenes, they share details of the campaign, and they let the audience get engaged and feel like they're participating in it. So by the time that campaign comes out, the consumers are the evangelists. They're already excited and engaged. It's a very smart play, and they're doing quite well. Again, we talk about this new transparency. People are going to check and see what you stand for. Uh, this is an app called Bicot. You go into a store, you scan the barcode, and it'll tell you if the company has good or bad practices. Very interesting. Consumers are making a lot of purchasing decisions based on what a company stands for. So what do you stand for? It's important to think about. Patagonia, which we'll hear about a little bit later in another presentation, we know they stand for sustainability. They had a campaign last year that said, don't buy this jacket. Recycle. Only buy it if you need it. And guess what? Their sales are up 38%. So what's next? What's on the horizon? Gen Z. Does anybody have kids under the age of 17? OK. You have an advantage. You live with the change makers. Because they are so damn smart these Gen Zs. They are highly sophisticated. Now, boomers, giant generation, Gen X, smaller. Again, Gen Y, giant generation. And now we have Gen Z, who are the children of Gen Xers. They are incredibly savvy. They are very different than Gen Y. They are research-oriented, and they're highly individual. And Gen X parents, because of their uh, interaction with Gen Ys in the workplace, have decided to raise them differently. They don't want their kids to necessarily feel special. They want them to be resilient. They want them to be practical. And Gen Zs have a very different perspective on spending, something to stay, keep aware of as they go to the future. They are incredibly mobile. We did a research study recently, and we asked kids under the age of 17, what is your favorite network? They didn't say to us ESPN. They didn't say uh, MTV. Their favorite networks are YouTube and Netflix. Changing. Now, what's also fascinating is that 50% of them access the web mobile only. So when I was talking about mobile being a priority, this is another reminder. 
What they're looking for in this social media driven world is they're looking for extreme. They're looking for things that are likely to be shared to give them social currency. The bar is much higher for them. So they want really well designed goods. They want things that are visually distinct and they want unique experiences, things that are going to really separate them from the crowd. Extreme is an idea that they are like bounty hunters looking for experiences that are going to distinguish them. They're so smart when it comes to technology that they're going to do research and find the best, most incredible products that they can possibly find. They're also rebels. They don't want to just support anybody. They're looking for people that stand for something. When we were growing up, we may have all gone through some sort of vaguely adolescent stage of being anti-establishment. But for Gen Z, they are looking to disrupt things for a reason. They are rebels with a cause. They are looking for people, brands, companies, experiences that stand for something. They want to save the world, but they're very practical. So the heroes and the brands that really mean something to them are the ones that are trying to change the world in a good way. Gen Z's live in a world that's very gray. It's very hard to know who the, who the bad guys are. So for them, it's great to understand what a company stands for in a black and white way. So that their heroes are distinct. The companies they support are distinct. It's a very big difference between Gen X, I mean Gen Y and Gen Z. So what does all this add up to? What it adds up to is that we're in a time where you have access to an enormous amount of information. You have access to an enormous amount of data. You probably know down to the second what your stores are selling, what products are working, what SKUs are working. But that's not going to help you solve the problem of being ready for the future. What's going to solve the problem is to be able to start to think differently, to open up to the possibility that there are new ways new audiences that you can capture. Now, there is great value in the power of legacy. And if you're in this room, it's because you've been doing something well for a long period of time. I'm not saying to give that up. What we are saying is let a little bit of new thinking in. Because if you can take a little bit of new thinking and balance it against a unique knowledge of who your audience is, that will give you the competitive advantage to not only succeed in the future, but to really establish yourself as a leading brand for the next 5, 10, 20 years. Thank you.